We said in the previous uh, session that there are two ways of making up new lexemes. One is to put two of them together, the right-hand one of which is the head lexeme. The other way of making up new lexemes is to take one lexeme and add a kind of ending onto it. We're now going to talk about that. Uh, namely about derived lexemes where the new lexeme is derived from one old lexeme which is its constituent. Let's have a look at a bunch of uh, complex lexemes and see if we can sort out a little bit about how this works. Let's look at movement for example. If we're going to hunt the lexeme inside movement, then it's move. Move is a lexeme in its own right, and it has had ment added to it. Lowly has the lexeme low inside it as a constituent, and it's had ly added to the end. Well, ment and ly aren't lexemes in their own right. Uh, they're not words. It becomes particularly interesting when we look at nationhood. Nation is obviously a lexeme, but what about hood? Is that the thing you put over your head? Or is it a criminal person, uh, to use a vernacular expression? Well, this particular hood is not a lexeme. Nationhood isn't some kind of uh, thing you put over your head, and it also isn't some kind of criminal. If it was a compound, it would have to be. And, of course, we could make up a brand new compound, nationhood, which is uh, probably a, a criminal who um, is of national importance, a nationhood. Or um, maybe it's a hood you put over your head which has a flag of your country on it or something. But that's not what nationhood means. So we have three component parts, ment, li, and hood, which are not themselves lexemes. So what are they? Well, they're morphemes. What's a morpheme? Well, we know that the morph bit we've met before, it has to do with the structure of things, particularly the structure of words, and the eme bit has to do with unit. So a morpheme is a unit of word form. Morphemes are the minimal building blocks of lexemes. It's what you build a lexeme out of. So, what do they have? Well, they have exactly what we found lexemes have. They have phonological form. They have some kind of syntactic or morphosyntactic grammatical function. And they have a meaning. Well, that means lexemes must be morphemes as well. And the answer to that is yes, they are because we found out that lexemes can be component parts of words. In order to understand how this works, we have to understand that not only do words have structure, but the meaning of the word is made up out of the meanings of its component parts. It may always not be straightforward quite how that works, but there's always a compositional element to it. Namely, words have a meaning that is to an extent predictable on the basis of its constituents. If it's totally predictable, then it's totally compositional. There's some doubt whether there are any words that are completely compositional, but we saw with the headedness of compounds that the head certainly plays a role. It normally designates the set of things that's being denoted, and the other word denotes the subset of things that's being denoted by the compound word. So uh, we have a partial compositionality there. Why, why this very long word? Well, let's break it down to compose. If you compose the meaning of a word, then you can compose it out of the meanings of its parts, and basically that's all it means. Well, to do that, there have to be word formation rules that say this is how words are constructed and this is how we are to understand their meaning. Word formation rules of the sort that create derived lexemes operate on a base. There is a particular word or a set of words that 
um, is used as the base for creating a new lexeme or a new set of lexemes. And the form of the base we've already met. The form of the base is the stem. You'll remember we met stems and they had inflections attached. The form of the base is the stem of the new lexeme and the affixes are the things that are attached to form derived words. Well, affix basically is derived from prefix and suffix. So prefixes and suffixes together form affixes, something which is affixed to a stem. So word formation rules are sensitive, as they must be, to the properties of the base. You can't just tack anything onto anything. These sensitivities are very complex and they're very interesting and uh, we can now only just look at a few of them. But basically, think of all the words you can with ity on it. Masculine, masculinity. What else? Any other ity? Well, well, ity, if you list all the words you know in ity, ity likes its bases not to be native words. In other words, it likes its bases to be borrowed. Masculine isn't a traditional English word. It was borrowed from uh, French. So, masculine, masculinity. Domestic, domestic, domesticity. I mean, domestic doesn't sound like a, a fully paid up English word. It, it's kind of fancy and it too was borrowed. It's a very strange property. Alone, however, is an English word. It's been an English word for a very long time. Well, alonity just doesn't work. The ITY says to its base, I say, are you English? And if it says, of course I'm English, it says, well, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Domestic, however, it has a chat to and domestic says, well, I was, I was French once. And it says, oh, goody, let's get together. What word formations do is they specify the form and the grammatical category and the meaning of the derived lexeme. In other words, they are the rule that makes the new word. They tell you everything you need to know about the new word. They can also sometimes do very strange things. They can change the sound shape of the word. That is, they can create morphophonemic changes. Phone, of course, has to do with sound. Morphophonemic has to do with the sound shape of a word. Remember ITY? Stick it on the end of domestic and what happens? Domestic ends in a K. Sound-wise, domestic. And then you tack ITY on the end and suddenly it's become domesticity. The K has become an S. In other words, that particular rule, the rule by which ITY is added to a, a stem, changes the sound of the stem. Let's take another example. Look at these bases. Commit. Put ION on the end. What happens? It becomes commission. Submit becomes submission. Admit becomes admission. Revert becomes reversion. Things are actually quite complicated here. Commit ends in T, and when you add ION, it becomes SH, the kind of SH sound. Submit also becomes SH, submission. Admit becomes admission, but revert becomes reversion, a different sound. Dominate becomes domination. There's been a, a change in the sound. The final sound of the stem has been changed just by the addition of the suffix. All right, let's finish by seeing how good we are at separating stems from affixes. Let's have a look at the word singularities. The best way to go about this is to start at the end, the right-hand end, and winkle the suffixes off one at, the, one at a time. Right. The first suffix that comes off is S, which is 
our old friend the plural. Then we get ity, and then we get ar. So we have single, singular, singularity, and singularities. What does that tell us? It tells us that suffixes are attached one at a time, and that in each case we have a binary structure, that is, two parts. Single is a lexeme, add singular, ar, and you get another lexeme, singular. And that's a lexeme on its own account. To that you can add ity, and you can get singularity. And to that you can add an s, because it's a noun, and so we have this nice little nested structure. In the case of neglectful, if we peel the full off, we're left with neglect, and you can't do anything else. Neglect can't be split in half. There are no other morphemes there. So this is just a stem, neglect, and one affix, full. Notice something interesting is happening here. To neglect something is a verb. He neglects. It has a plural. It has a past tense, rather, neglected. But when you add full, it becomes an adjective. So one of the things that word formation rules do is they change the category of their stem. You start with a stem with one category and add an affix, and you end up with a new lexeme with a different category. Soils. Well, that's our old friend S, the plural again and you can't do anything about soil. This isn't S plus oil, it's just soil. Deliberation is interesting because we maybe put A-T-I-O-N on deliber. No, we have deliberate plus I-O-N. No. What's going on here? Deliberation, maybe if you pull the ION off, you think that it starts with deliberate, but deliberation is having a long talk. Is this D-liberation? That is, uh, there was liberation and then it stopped and that was deliberation. Well, no, that doesn't make any sense either. This is quite a difficult word to peel apart, but certainly either ATION or ION is uh, uh, an affix. Sacrifices gives us some more heartburn. The S is okay because uh, that's the plural. But do we want to separate sacri from fice? Probably not. If we were knowledgeable about Latin, we would probably know that in Latin anyway, the sacri bit and the fice bit were different morphemes, but in English that really isn't the case anymore. Artificially, well, we can peel the ly off the end, then we get artificial, and uh, then we peel the AL off and we get artifice. That's basically how that one goes. What this exercise illustrates is uh, sometimes the processes are not clear cut, but fortunately sometimes they are. Generally we can make a pretty good fist of saying which bits come off, which bits are the real affixes, the productive affixes that um, we can rely on. In other cases like deliberation it's really quite tricky and uh, it takes quite a long time to get sensitive to how these processes work.